numbers uh, starting right now and we talk about um ending um this oh we talk about the 16 days of activism against gbv and uh, we'll just start by setting the stage of uh, knowing why 16 days and uh, what this actually means to us before we get into the nitty-gritty of our conversation tonight i will request uh, commissioner nakafero to actually speak to us about 16 days and of course answer very basic and simple question of why 16 and not 6 or 14 or 1 welcome Thank you very much, Mr. Zuksoka, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uganda joins the rest of the world to celebrate the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. These are days that are running from the 25th of November, which is the International Day for Elimination of All Forms of Violence Against Women and Girls, up to the 10th of December, which is the International Day for Human Rights. So in between those 16, the, between uh, 25th November, the International Day for Elimination of All Forms of Violence mm. Against Women, and 10th December, the International Day for Human Rights, we want to challenge everybody, ourselves inclusive, towards all efforts in terms of eliminating all forms of violence against women mm. and uh, of course uh, by the end of the those 16 days we'll be celebrating the international human rights day mm. <clears throat> the message behind this is the fact that uh, violence against women and girls is a violation of uh, their human rights and it's, an, it's not acceptable and of course this is a global campaign not only in uganda but throughout the country mm. where we are saying enough is enough we need to eliminate all forms of violence against women for this particular year our theme is uh, fund prevent mm. collect and prevent respond all forms of violence against women mm. we are talking about that form that theme mainly because we have issues around funding Mm. Most of these are interventions towards elimination of violence against women have not well been funded mm. by the different stakeholders, including government. And of course, uh, we are also saying that uh, during COVID, we've had an escalation of gender-based violence. Women and girls have been the major victims of all these kind of vices. Mm. What we are saying is we need to respond in terms of appropriate services to the needs of the survivors. Okay. We are also saying that uh, behind all these forms of violence is a face, mm. a human face. Mm. And of course we need to know who is this human face all about? Mm. What is the age? Where is she? What form of violence? What are her, her needs? Mm. So we are saying we need to collect data mm. and evidence because uh, in government, all our programs are informed by evidence and data. Okay. So if you are going to design a very good national program, some okay. of them are already ongoing. Okay. If you are going to escalate, scale them up, we need evidence and data okay. on what is happening in oh. terms of violence. Okay. Then lastly, yes. is the component of preventing. Mm. All our efforts should be aimed at preventing different forms of violence against women and girls. Okay, you've set the stage going on. And, um, well, I think we'll talk to a statistician who will give us this, um, the, the different statistics that we actually need to know to inform our discussion here. But I think before we get into all the nitty-gritty, I will just welcome now um, a, a, a very short video clip here from uh, uh, more ideas uh, to uh, set the ball rolling because we need to actually know why. Uh, I, I can actually explain why uh, the rest of you are here, but um, uh, uh, Morris just looks the old man uh, out of this conversation, but we need to hear from him by, uh, of course, watching this video first. Let's get to the video, uh, then uh, uh, Morris comes on uh, to speak to us about this day. Ah, 
Mwana kwe mina. Ebi senge vio kila. Necha alichu na chuna chimanyi. Niko mama tuwa na basiza bacha. Nibi ntari vio kikara nori ya bitikaka. Mwakaza aliona abona abona. Mina. Omunya uwa. Achi. Katichiku gasa cho kwa la sente. Nyinja tenga tugenda ze ya galila. Ha. Debo mtu. Debo kwa u. Nibi harumu binyansi. Mamãe, você Bomboca, <coughs> 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 Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, Maurice, I'll just get to you uh, from the more ideas. Yeah, uh, this is um, your piece of work. So it's uh, this a, a, a demo mm. for uh, the film named Stain. Mm. So basically, there is a whole other film. Mm. Yes. Well, talk to us how, how you come into this conversation of um, um, ending violence against okay. um, women. And as, as a creative, as a creative, mm. actually, I come from a creative part of the world. Okay. Unlike <laughs> the rest of the people, like you asked, mm. how do I come in? So, uh, as a creative director and a filmmaker. I thought, what other way? Because I see these things happening every day. Mm. I mean, in our homes, I'm a father, I have daughters. Mm. Incidentally, then I come from a background of a barracks. So growing up as a child, I kept seeing all these anomalies taking place. Mm. You get the point. So they usually say that a writer or a, an artist sheds his sickness on paper. Mm. This means that what you have in your mind is what you do, what? Is mm. what you bring out. Just like a song. So basically, that's how I was only giving you a background of how I came up with this film. Mm. So while other people make policies, others call the shots. Now me as a filmmaker, I thought, why don't I coin something down that will probably change perceptions, mm. that will alter mindsets, mm. that will kick out prejudices. Mm. You get it? Mm. Because in this one wonderful world, God created a man and a woman. Mm. So basically, this film attempts to right the wrongs mm. that are actually taking place in the world. Mm. So I decided that why not point towards GBV? Mm. You get the point. So while someone stands on a microphone and says statistics, the other one speaks numbers and figures, Morris Mugisha will come out and paint a picture of the anomalies taking place in the what? Mm. In the world. That's case in point. You notice that uh, this film and the locations and everything are not within the city. Mm. Because half the time when you leave your village, you come to the city, sometimes you don't want to go back, or sometimes you, you play the blind eye. You get the point. You don't know what is taking place. But Maurice Mugisha and the team decided to go far away, where, where actually this, this location is Kasese. Mm. You get it? You did that in Kasese. Exactly. Mm. I think you can see Lake Katwe mm. taking place. If I'm to give you a brief preamble of what that place is like, mm. there are so many people from different walks of life, many tribes. You find the Basoga, you find people from across the border, you find the, the predominant tribe in Kasese. The uh, Bakonjo. The Bakonjo, exactly. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. You find Bachiga, then you find the Baganda. So in this film, I decided to amalgamate a husband who is a Westerner and the wife who is a Muganda. Mm. You get the point. Then they have this child. However, the woman comes with the child in a relationship. You get the point. Mm. So they try to leave. This woman is around 26, 27 years. So decides to have a, a man who is above 
40 years for her husband, hoping that probably things will do what? Mm, what will go okay. Mm. But somehow, if within the household, things go amiss. To a point that this woman decides not to just sit back and lay back, you get it, but decides to go ahead and work in the salt mine. And if you know something about that salt mine, there's uh, sodium chloride and ammonia. Those are uh, mm. those gases that take place when the whole process takes place, when the sun hits the waters. There's under there's, the, there's what they call the, the rock salt. Mm. So she goes and mines. I don't know if you took a good look at her, the woman hitting the ground. She couldn't stay on the showers because of the showers, you earn very little. So you don't, you actually don't make up, you know, because the husband, the husband is maimed, he has a wound on the leg, so he can't step in the water, so he can't go out and work. Then she has a child on the back. What am I saying? I'm not only uh, trying to exhibit suffering or anything. I'm trying to, sh to reflect my aunties. I come from the western part of Uganda. Mm. So my aunties, I have aunties like that, who hustle, who have two, four, five kids. This is reality that I'm trying to paint here. Okay. So I'm speaking from the bottom of my heart. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, there's nothing cosmetic okay. about this film. Okay. So basically at the end of the day, this film is meant to touch hearts, even those stubborn hearts, okay. who don't want to, who pretend that they don't face the reality. Mm. You get the point. Okay. But such is the reality of life. Okay. And Maurice Mugisha, a filmmaker, okay. comes out to expose this and okay. put it in the light. Okay. So all in all, mm. I'm unmasking the evils mm. of society okay. and such is GBV. Okay, thank you very much. Staying. Well, thank you so much. We'll um, um, have follow-ups later on here, but uh, let me now welcome to this conversation Dr. Kagorosi from um, Amre. First, I'll speak to us and how much they're actually doing uh, in as far as awareness is actually concerned. Uh, let, let's hear from Amre now um, in this whole uh, um, uh, scenario here as we're talking about uh, the dialogue of the 16 days of activism against um, gender-based violence against women. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, once again, good afternoon, uh, viewers. Um, Amri Health Africa in Uganda and also globally is really pleased to work with uh, our different partners, mm. uh, including you, the media. I'm happy about uh, Morris's pr uh, production at uh, the ministries, our fellow partners, uh, Sehud, mm. uh, really to bring uh, to the front uh, the issue of uh, gender-based violence. Um, Evidence shows that uh, more than half of our population uh, has faced uh, a form of violence, one or the other. Mm. But the bigger burden is uh, on uh, women and children. So the women and the girls, rather, mm. and then children. And uh, it manifests, by the time we see uh, this form of violence, it manifests as one, a teenage pregnancy, it will manifest as a rape, it will manifest as uh, an injury, it will manifest as a school dropout, mm. uh, it will manifest um, in mental problems. And us who have the medical background, you will see things like sexually transmitted diseases mm. and the high infection of HIV among young people. Mm. Maybe to remind the nation that more than half of the new HIV infections in Uganda occur among young people who are less than 24 years old. Mm. And uh, who are these? Uh, ma the majority are girls. Uh, girls who have uh, perhaps had a forced uh, relationship, one which was perhaps decided because um, the parents chose uh, to get dowry uh, from, for, from this girl. And of course, once this relationship has happened, the girl cannot go back to school. Uh, she will now start a journey of um, unpaid labor. She will work all her life. Uh, a girl who's supposed to have grown out to be like Miss Naka Ferro here or Rebecca Kadaga will now uh, eternally face uh, this violence. Mm. And this is the human face of, uh, of uh, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. So as AMREF, uh, we, we really want to bring this to the surface and tell Ugandans and the world that the world is paying a very high cost of loss of uh, what would otherwise be very good uh, human capital in form of educated girls, girls who are contributing uh, to the economy and they are being lost because of the violence that they face. And uh, there's nothing like uh, as bad as or confidence killing as if you've had 
this young girl who is really trying to become a responsible woman and uh, she faces violence her confidence will eternally go down sure and she will never come back into the surface to say okay mm -hmm. i am here maybe seeking a job it takes a lot of effort mm -hmm. to bring up uh, such girls okay and that's why we are going for prevention okay secondly that's why we are campaigning for increased investment mm -hmm. we are campaigning for using evidence-based uh, approaches mm -hmm. and also to bring to light like maurice has uh, has mentioned uh you would be surprised to find that uh Female genital mutilation mm. in practicing districts mm. is still as high as 66 percent. Meaning, if uh, uh, up six, until today, up until today, mm. six in ten girls undergo that FGM, undergo that the, that FGM mm. in some part is still 100 100 percent mm. among the the, the pockets, for mm. example. And uh, what does that mean? It will mean that once this lady goes for a reproductive age mm. and is trying to fulfill. Uh, the reproductive responsibility the the, the 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 delivery is going to be very difficult because she was mutilated mm. the child will perhaps die uh if not the woman will survive with very serious complications mm. including fistula mm. so just to answer your question this is what uh, gender-based violence is about okay uh because they are girls and and women and their power they don't have sufficient power to argue out or defend themselves okay from these kinds of violations mm. they end up enduring that and internally uh facing the consequences so that's why we are coming out really to bring it out to the world mm. and to join others are uh, really to uh say we must end violence in all its forms against okay well, well thank you so much uh, but Dorothy let me come to here uh, from uh, Sehad um, I just want to see how we also come into the question here of uh, trying to end the 16 days of violence um, human rights and, and of course a number of things uh, but let me just know from you what you as Sehad actually doing uh, in this particular campaign that we're running um, thank you so much. Um, Center for Health, Human Rights and Development has been committed actually in the 16 days of activism to actually look back into the laws and the policies mm. that Uganda has been proactively passing and developing. So basically, C Center for Health, Human Rights and Development is more interested in promoting social justice in health. And we're doing this through an integrated approach. This approach includes strategic litigation, for mm. example, where we look out for cases and bring them to courts of law challenging gaps that are in our policies or laws mm. as one of the strategies to amplify the plight of women and girls. Mm go through especially in the different spaces for example he's talked about the violations such as defilement he's talked about rape sexual exploitation forced marriages mm. and so many other issues that young girls and women continue to face so we bring these voices through challenging mm. and trying to see that our precedent um, changes or the perception or the narrative mm. on, on these rights beyond just the paper to actually implementing them. That's mm. one of the strategies we use. The other strategy is, of course, um, um, evidence-based research, mm. calling for action. We go out to the communities and, you know, we collect this data, we do policy and legal analysis, we see where the gaps are and how we relate them to what the community is actually going through. Are we structuring our laws and policies to suit the needs and the demands of our population or are they just cosmetic? Mm. We evaluate and weigh them. And then, of course, the other bit is, of course, campaigns, um, advocacy, generally and through this season we've been capturing voices we've been um airing on televisions i'm sure you've seen some of them future in the different media spaces uh we've not yet gotten an opportunity to come to ubc but even right now we're actually on ubc doing the same through exactly. the partnership mm. with um amref mm. so thank you so much amref for this opportunity so we we use uh social media and uh, media spaces radio uh tvs to bring the stories to paint her face because when you talk about legal for example because when it says social justice in health people look at the law mainly but people don't connect the law to the human beings mm. so what we do is actually capture these voices like teenage pregnancies we, we we identify like champions to share with us the experiences and for the world to see that we can do better mm. we've also interviewed journalists who cover these different stories and worked with uh media houses to amplify such issues more so those are through partnerships uh, also collaborations with AMRA, for example ministries ministry of gender ministry of health because we understand that it's a holistic approach center for health and human rights and development cannot do this alone okay 
everybody has their strengths. So that is typically what we are doing, okay. and also strategic communication. Mm. And this is also used through advocacy. We look at what are those controversial issues that people don't talk about. Okay. Now, when we're talking about sexual and gender-based violence, oftentimes issues of sexuality education mm. are swept under the carpet unsafe abortion because people don't know how to approach these issues mm. so we take advantage of our legal background to go into the communities find out people's perceptions about these contested issues and design tools or communication to tools that people can relate to and the messages are designed specifically for the different targets that we want to the message to reach out to like if, if it's ministry of gender labor and social development will go to the laws that fall under that docket and mm. frame those messages for policy change or legal change. Okay. If it's uh, CSOs, collectively, what advocacy tool can we use so that these issues are not shied away from and not just left to say okay. for example. Mm. And the list goes on. Okay. Uh, uh, academia, for example, we value research too. So we find that these partnerships really help us okay. eventually come up with a holistic approach in terms of messaging okay. and languaging. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We'll uh, just get to um, uh, Kasim Noor here from uh, UBOS. Uh, Prokhala, first of all, give us those statistics and uh, the recommendations from uh, what you got. I heard from uh, Dr. Kangrosia same, uh, up to about 67% in some places, and even up to 100% among us, the Pokot still do uh, practice um, FGM, which I think is also a deadly thing to do. Um, Noor, if you are with us, and you can still hear us, please go ahead and speak to us. We need to hear from you. Talk to us about those findings and uh, uh, the possible recommendations that you also gave uh, that uh, need to be worked on. If you can hear us, we are where you are. Are mm -hmm. from Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Now, uh, you know that Uganda Bureau of Statistics is mandated to provide accurate and reliable official statistics for to be able to come up with better policies and recommendations for, for all interventions across. Now, uh, with, with AMREF, uh, with the support of AMREF, mm. we were able to carry out a rapid assessment in the areas of Karamoja, and the areas of, uh, of uh, the Sabines who had uh, migrated. So as a world background, we realized that FGM, because FGM, because FGM is, uh, is it's against the human rights, mm. and it's not acceptable to, to everyone, it has been practiced as a, a culture. It's deeply rooted in the traditions of some people especially in the Sabine area and uh, in, the Kar in the Karamoja area in Bujiri. So we realized that there have been many studies on this. And uh, in 2011 and 2016, there was, there was a general decrease at national level from 1.4 to 0 0.3 in the FGM and uh, cutting, it's generally called cutting. However, if we look at Karamoja only, it takes up the biggest proportion of 6.4 across the whole country. So with, that, with such a proportion, I'm with great interventions requested the Uganda Bureau of Statistics to carry out a study to establish this magnitude at lower levels and to also establish if there are several factors that could have ignited this because there was a reported escalation in the previous years uh, compared to the, the, the 2011. So what were the possible factors that generated this and also, with the discussion from these people, come up with socially acceptable uh, recommendations because we do not believe in uh, sitting up there and coming up with a decision that is not accepted by the people themselves. So we thought going to ask them what would be done to enable them address this uh, this vice, like, um, or this this habit that we are doing. So from the study we realized, we found out that, of course, this study was both quantitative and qualitative to be able to address all those issues. And we realized that generally, in Mor the there was only a reduction in Moroto. Amdat and Nakapiripirit registered higher numbers, where we see that from 2016 to 2020, there is an increase from 43 to 53, by almost 10% in Amdat, 
and then 49 to 52 in Nakapiripirit. So such big differences of about 10 percent in a, a four-year period, a five, four, four, five-year period, uh, indicates several reasons. But when we go to the migrant subbings in uh, Wijiri, somehow the, the census so show that more subbings were found in Wijiri. So perhaps they migrated. And of course, when we discuss with them, they tell that they were looking for a better pasture to live in. So we realize that still, the prevalence rate among those migrants have been was about 11% of uh, all the women that we found there. So you would not you would not find t 10 women you among each any 10 women you would still find one woman who has been cut in 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 Bujiri, uh, region in Bujiri district district. And from this we see that most of these women are married. About 94% were married. So it means marriage could be a driver for these for this act. Should you be married before you get, should you be cut before you get married? That was something to, to, to explore. We also see that older women were mostly cut and the average years for cutting was 16 to 18. And we realize that that is the age for getting married. So in terms of FGM and, and child marriage, we see that 69% of the girls who get cut uh, as, as soon as you get cut at 16, you get married. So what, what was the, 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 the relationship? We realized that, that people had to, get had to get cut before they got married. And most of these girls had no, of, no formal schooling. About 48% of the people who were cut had not gone to school at all. But through our discussions, basically we interacted with the, these elders, the church leaders, the police, the health facilities, the elders in these regions, and they told us that this was a source of income. We actually also interacted with the, the cutters themselves, and they said we were promised a tandy qua, something called a tandy qua, mm. so that we can stop cutting, but we cannot because each woman gets 20,000. Each cutter gets 20,000 for cutting one woman, and a, a, a hen, who would refuse a hen and 20,000? in the accompaniments, eating, and so on and so forth. And of course, in the rural, suburb, uh, rural Karamoja region, among the Pokot and Tepet, we see that these girls who are cut fetch more, fetch more dowry. If you're cut, you fetch more dowry because you accompany your man. You are a woman, you're not a girl as, uh, as a woman who has not been, been cut. So. There's a lot of discrimination and victimization. They call you names, this girl, just like in Mbada, where they call a man who is not circumcised to be a boy. This girl, <clears throat> these ladies are called girls. So, there are lots of beliefs. The, 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 they also believe, for example, in uh, Bujiri, you realize that the women believe that they are women, the men believe that they are women, do not, do not, are not, uh, they do not funny, they do not commit adultery. They, they are not promiscuous if they are cut. Mm. They even compare them with their own the women of their area, like they, they are soccer women. Mm. So there are lots of cultural beliefs according to them, especially in the rural rural areas where you do not want to move with your husband, you're not allowed to move with your husband, you cannot accompany him to a party, you cannot do certain activities okay. just because you have been cut. Okay. So the, the other reasons that, that came out were that politicians do not come out to speak yeah. against this and say that this is bad. Actually, it was even found that some politicians use it and say this is our culture. In, 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 in the times of uh, campaigns, they say, no, 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 this is your culture, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So that was an issue. And then our parents who were not educated, they also would influence their... Uh, um, uh, Noor, just tell us the recommendations. W what are some of these recommendations very pertinent that you actually gave uh, that require action? Well, I just hope you're still with us. Um, okay. I, 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 the, yes. The preventing... The recommendations stem from the preventive mechanisms where we, we, we realize that we, we are suggesting that there is a law between our country and the neighboring countries okay. where we see that. Yes, mm. please. 
Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead and speak to us. We, we're now listening to the recommendations. We, we, we wish that there are more preventive mechanisms um, compared to the actual, to, to, to stopping the habits. We, we, we hope that they can, the country can, uh, can uh, be able to liaise with the, uh, we don't, do you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you. We're hearing you. Yes, because if the girls are going to go across the border, what, what is there? Because as soon as they, they go, they would get cut across and come back. And then the other thing was the anti-FGM law. The law should be in, they, they, they wish that the law should be, it shouldn't be just imposed on them. There should be a, a, a discussion with the mm. And we be able to come up with something that is within themselves, come up with and say we are stopping this, and then we just uh, people uh, that we are former cultures, and uh, we encourage education. Okay. Well, we'll take it from there. We've had um, a, a small problem and challenge here in our connectivity, I think because of the weather, but we'll be able to return to you. We thank you so much for the details and, of course, for uh, the statistics that you've just shared with us. Uh, you've helped us answer um, quite a number of questions of uh, really knowing um, uh, the, the impact itself, the magnitude, uh, the report findings, and, and some of these uh, recommendations here. Uh, talking about the anti-FGM law, uh, for example, we thought if uh, by this time on HM Tai was actually with us in studios, I uh, should be uh, the best person to uh, talk about this but we we'll still uh, get there as, as you also plan to um, have uh, other panelists who is um, uh, on zoom from uh, uh, Amuru um, uh, Mr. Court um, are you still with us? Okay, well, I think a court has also just got a problem. Now, coming back to studios, as uh, we organize those who um, in, in virtual space, I also expect to be joined by... Uh, oh, a court, can you hear us? No, you can't hear us. She can't hear us. I think she can't hear us. I'm only seeing you nod your head. Um, well, let's work on uh, the connectivity. It, it's raining in Kampala. I don't know what is in Amuru. It's raining very heavily in Kampala. And um, I, I just don't know what is in Amuru, but we'll try to connect and come back to you. Uh, coming back to my panelists in studios, um, a lot of things are coming in here. And, and I think um, uh, Dorothy talked about it. Um, uh, she has also highlighted it, the cultural issue here. And, and it's one of the questions that I'd uh, plan to pose to uh, Maurice. And I think to all of you here, in 2018, a government moved ahead and launched what they called the National sexuality education framework it, it got a lot of problems uh, from uh, uh, the, the cultural uh, uh, perspective and from the religious setting because um, they, they looked at it as as though it wasn't actually something that was desired you, you know that very well uh, and so we have moved on as government to actually have these policies come on we have had different frameworks come on and, and yet we've not consulted from the wider range of all the stakeholders I, I want us to talk about these things and, and see how it actually all blends in just taking or, or, or contextualizing the national uh, uh, sexuality education uh, uh, policy that, that I know you actually interrupted with. It, it caused a lot of uh, hula baloo and debate on, on, on media uh, about it, but this is actually an initiative that government had actually come in through with. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Commissioner Nakafero. O on these particular policies that we do, involving and, and, and bringing everybody on board, especially from uh, the other angles of culture and religion. Thank you very much. I would like to thank... Uh my sister from Obos for shedding light mm. on the real issues around uh, some of these cultural practices. Mm. And in, in order to answer your question, I want to make it very clear that in all the policies and laws that the government of Uganda adopts, mm. there's always a wide consultation of all stakeholders. Mm. Even with sexuality education framework, mm. the were real serious consultations with all the key stakeholders. Mm. Maybe where we need to appreciate the, the contradictions mm. is in the aspect of people trying to defend their culture. Mm. And this is the case mm. with female genital mutilation. Mm. You will also find spaces in Uganda where people are defending child marriage. Mm. That is part of us. Mm. You will find societies def def defending polygamy that is part of me mm. but 
What's important to note at the end of the day, fellow Ugandans, is the fact that women's rights mm. and girls' rights are always undermined. Mm. And of course, it comes up with so many implications. Dr. really elabor elaborated on so many of these. These are national issues of issues of national development. Because mm. uh, if we are going to continue saying it's our culture, yet at the same time women's rights are undermined, mm. right to health is undermined, right to education, because she's eff emphasizing the fact that as long as you're cut and you're 16, mm. 16, 17, mm. you're then married off. So it means that this girl has to drop out of school. Okay. And of C course... Commissioner, hold it here. Let, 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 let me first know from um, a, a, a quote. Can you now follow us? Can you hear us very ably? And can you can speak back to us? Yes, please. I'm hearing you well. Thank, thank you very much. Let, let, let's, let's first hear from you and, and your submission. Thank you very much. I'm called a court Margaret, Assistant District Health Officer Amuro. Mm. I'm grateful and privileged to be with you this evening. In fact, Amora said this week is so touched with the rampant raising number of uh, gender-based violence, more so in the hard-to-reach areas. Now Amora has so many hard-to-reach areas. So we normally work closely with partners, more so AMREF. We plan for integrated youth outreaches, and we also form community groups. That is a community group of 60, whereby 30 are women and 30 are youth. We sensitize them on the dangers of gender-based violence, and we also sensitize youth on their sexual, sexual reproductive rights. We also link up with our VHTs, local leaders, whereby they make referrals. There is always a linkage between LC1, VHT, health facility, and uh, police. So we engage even uh, religious leaders, cultural leaders. Why do we engage cu cultural leaders? We know very well that the people who are from in the community telling their sons to marry as many women as they can. And this is one of the causes of gender-based violence. And if it comes on the issue of land, they normally neglect the widows. And the widows are thrown away. That's why we brought these uh, cultural leaders abroad so that they promote positive cultural norms. With the AMREF, we sensitize these groups of uh, people through outreaches, and we also organize youth events with the support from AMREF. During these youth events, we sensitize them a lot. And if we are to reach Amuru, we have even uh, youth champions, youth leaders, they go and sensitize fellow youth. After we have sensitized them, they go deep, because there are some areas in Amuru you can take even two days without reaching. So those are the areas we feel we should really work hand in hand with the AMREF. More so during this COVID period, AMREF was so useful to Amur District. I repeat, AMREF was useful to Amur District. Sending Amur for radio talk shows, radio drives, sensitizing the community while observing social distancing. And we have seen that through outreaches. We are seeing that the community, some of them come and testify by themselves. That why don't you continue with the outreaches instead of us coming to the health facilities? And we were grateful to hear that. So we are strengthening our outreaches with the support from community. The same with the water, water source committees. Even the social what oh, I mean the water source committees help us a lot in sensitizing the community when they have their meetings during the time they are protecting wells. They they called upon the youth to be the champion in that protection of wells. 
You know very well we, in Amur we have so many youth who, who are doing nothing totally. But through outreaches, we have made them to come into groups. In those groups, Amref is supporting them and they have uh, some income generating activities. Some of them even opt to go, for the, for, to go back to school. You know, during uh, camp, when people went back home, that was the beginning of uh, gender-based violence. Those people were struggling on where to stay, where, how to stay, and it brought a lot of gender-based violence. And as I'm talking now, Amuru is having 26 percent percent as a number for gender-based violence. And it, teenage pregnancy is at 24 percent, which is painful to Amuru district. And we shall not wait that the ministry should come in. We normally have a different network implementing partners and AMREF is taking lead among these IPs. So this is the state of Amur district, as I, as I talk now. Okay. Well, well thank you so much, um, Assistant Commissioner, just right there, uh, Assistant DH, um, uh, District Health Commissioner DH, from Amur. Oh. Yes. yes, well, thank you so much. We've actually got uh, that very good discussion from you, and uh, we'll uh, come back uh, to you, but we thank you so much for enriching us uh, with uh, uh, this information that you've just given to us, and I think the situation in Amur is actually um, also a very bad one. Now, remember, Amur is one of Uganda's districts that are at the border, and uh, the porous borders that we have um, is also costing us a lot of things. Uh, we had from um, a court there, um, actually not from a court, but uh, from a new record who said uh, that the cross-border movements also need to be managed. And I remembered, um, I think it was sometime last year or in 2018, uh, when uh, the government of Uganda and the government of Kenya uh, met in Moroto. The truck will talk about these issues of um, uh, moving uh, back and forth from uh, one country to the other. And remember, these are people who share and have the same uh, cultures. Um, uh, let me come to Dorothy uh, on this particular one, because I saw you nodding your head when we talk about uh, the, the sexuality framework that government actually passed. And it had a lot of tantrums here and there, uh, from uh, especially the religious leaders and the cultural leaders are putting that into context that uh, they need to be a uh, part of the processes. Um, thank you so much. So the issue of sexuality education in Uganda remains controversial and it will continue remaining controversial for as long as we are a conservative country, morally upright, as we want to call ourselves, we will keep on sweeping issues under the carpet. The issue of the sexuality education framework is dear to us because we deal with young people at Center for Health, Human Rights and Development. When this framework was passed, it, it was actually after a country ban on all forms of sexuality education. Mm -hmm. In the country, and so Sehad was, you know, perturbed. We wondered why you would ban this relevant information nationwide. Mm -hmm. So we actually went to court. We have a, a, um, a sexuality education case that we still are waiting for the final judgment. Still in court? Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, while we're following up on this matter, along the way, um, the Ministry of Education picked up the issues and actually passed this framework. It is a good framework, and I really want to thank the Ministry of Education, actually, for the initiative it took. Mm -hmm. I know that it took so many consultations with different stakeholders, but till to date, it's failed to be implemented as we would have wished to. Why? Because of the opposition or this word that we normally call opposition. And who is opposition ideally? People who don't agree with us or the ideologies when we start talking about the human rights approach. Mm -hmm. So sexuality education has first a sit back majorly because most cultural leaders or institutions mm -hmm. Well, first of all, bias by its name, sexuality education. Sexuality education, yes. Are you going to teach our uh, young and people? And the category is in there because the person read that whole policy. I also read that whole Thank document. You. And one of the issues that to actually talk about their way, the, the ages of consultation, talk about children of uh, uh, below three years uh, to, to talk about sexuality and all the things to involve them and engage them. So that was the misconception again. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to how do we capture as media also? It sold. They put a three-year-old on a, head, a news headline. Yes, exactly. And is government planning to teach three-year-olds how to 
mm -hmm. engage in sex because when we talk about sexuality our minds go to the sex act mm -hmm. we do not look at the holistic understanding of what sexuality education means mm -hmm. and when you look at this framework actually it breaks down it has different components and different age groups of what information is giving out is given out to a particular age group mm -hmm. there are issues to do with menstrual hygiene for example there are issues to do with how do you look after your body at a certain age how do you identify bad touches issues to do with um of course contraceptives are always controversial because again the idea was we're teaching people how to start using family planning but no if people actually realize the content of this it gives you very vital information regarding how the youth can understand issues around sexuality and at what age and how to prepare themselves mm. in terms of even the issues we talk about defilement uh rape most of these issues are coming up because we do not appreciate the content and the language. Mm. And we've seen cases actually lost in court. For example, um, now that we've talked about FGM, I'll give you an example. In Quen, uh, a magistrate declined to, to pass a uh, judgment in our favor because they simply say that the, the, the state attorneys had failed to produce the clitoris that was cut off. Mm. As, court, evidence in court. A, as evidence in court. As evidence in court. <laughs> and and when you looked at this you wondered really like where is the moral issue and protection because some sexuality sexual offenses are unique in nature for crying out loud our judicial system really needs to be revised mm. because evidence is crucial and what am i talking about and bringing out all these issues when you talk about sexuality education you're building the confidence of young people of the nation of a woman of a mm. young girl to boldly talk about these issues and call them as they are mm. The courts have all recognized a certain particular kind of English. Mm -hmm. But when you're framing sexuality issues, people are shy. Sex talk is a taboo. Mm -hmm. If someone is before court, she can't start saying, the man did this to me, and after he proceeded to put this, his thing. Now, courts do not want to hear such language. They want it to be blunt. Mm -hmm. But again, the environment around us does not enable us to express as is. And we thought that actually the sexuality education framework could be one of the remedies. Mm -hmm. So we've gone into the values-based approach okay. where we uphold religion and cultural mm. values at the cost of the real lived realities of our population. Let's be particular, the young people, women and girls, but also the boys and mm. uh, the men. Mm. Because sexual exploitation, for example, doesn't just happen to a woman by herself. There has to be what we normally call the perpetrator. That is the mm. common language, mm. which actually should not even be because when we're designing approaches there's already a bias this information mm. should be left out to the public to discern and know how to actually conduct themselves when it comes to issues of sexual sexuality education beyond just the sex or the act itself okay so at the moment mm. it's still contested and as center for health human rights and development we're actually alive to the fact that cultural leaders or institutions and religious leaders are great power holders mm. in our advocates we call them invisible power holders oh, people okay. listen to them at podiums when they go to talk people actually mm. listen so what is the issue that they're spreading out there what is their message okay. they're spreading out there so if we brought them on board and again this is the issue here what are our concentrated efforts mm. on actually trying to bring religious and cultural leaders on board because most of them are actually the the catalyst of these cultural practices and i want us to be very alive not all culture is bad not all religious values are bad, but where is our meeting point? As a nation, we need to start getting alive to mapping issues or cultural practices that are actually excavating or increasing incidents of sexual and gender-based mm. violence. And among them is the female genital mutilation. It is really terrible, but you cannot talk about this. Already they are telling you that the act was uh, passed without their consultations. You see, so what are our approaches? Are they people sensitive? Do people actually understand these I issues? Is also key when we're designing interventions. But most importantly, mm. we cannot under it. In fact, most of our advocacy efforts, if we really want to combat or prevent sexual gender-based violence, is bringing on board the dissenting voices and trying to understand where they are coming from and finding a middle 
ground. Okay. Well, well Morris, I'll come to you later, but let me first come to uh, Mr. Dr. Kagurusi here. Uh, I want to see, uh, she used the word uh, uh, the perpetrators, uh, and of course it's a bias actually to say the perpetrators. Once you are in a campaign and, and you start by identifying another group as, as perpetrators, yes, um, it, 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 it evidently um, shows uh, the bias in there. But, but is, here is where we are, and I thank Amre for the good work that you're actually doing to um, engage all the other stakeholders to see that we get here. But how are you involving um, these perpetrators, first of all, challenging them um, uh, to, to ch actually change behavior or bring the men on board to help eradicate this, um, like she rightly says, when we talk about violence against another, then there is somebody actually who makes that violence um, against the other. And I just want to know uh, but what could be in plan for, y what, what you have in plan as, as Amref to actually bring them on board, engage them and do the things to, to, to ensure that this ends. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the <coughs> activities we are doing to bring everybody on board is mm. uh, this convening act. We are here in the media. Okay. Uh, we are discussing with our colleagues with, uh, with the legal background. We are discussing with the filmmaker. Maybe from here you will trick the movie mm. uh, to bring out the human face. Of yes, the I, I also want to know from him whether the, the, the status um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Minister of, uh, of Gender is here, well represented. And this is really the convening act that we are, we, we are doing uh, to, to make sure you get everybody on board mm. and speaking out loud and boldly about these things. Mm. But I think it's good to first of all also paint a picture of how uh, sexual and gender-based violence actually happens. Uh, I have two daughters and God forbid they should never go through uh, this, kind of, this kind of thing. Um, imagine a nine-year-old old girl and we referred even the three-year-old. Uh, in the in the clip, you saw how the three, either the three-year-old or five-year-old, I don't know how old uh, that child was, but was looking and seeing what the father was doing to the to mother. mother. Mm. Um, okay, but but mm. uh, uh, but Morris himself told us here that as he was growing up, these are the things he saw either from the barracks or somewhere mm. on how people were interacting and how this gender-based violence manifested. So it starts from there. How do you relate uh, to, the, to, to, to your spouse and what are the children seeing? And this is where the transformation should be. I'm also not saying you start giving uh, sex education to young children, but to teach them how to relate. Mm -hmm. How young boys should respect young girls and how men should respect uh, women. And they will grow up in that way and they will not depart from it. But if you teach, the, the, the only thing you, the child sees is violence against the, 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 the mother. Mm. Um, if the young boy is growing up and sees um, the sister who is nine years old or 16 years old being married off at that age, he grows up not knowing any other alternative. So it starts from there. There is what the individual knows, and the individual should know how do I defend myself if I'm caught up in a situation of violence. It starts with also how much power do they have can she decide to say no against people who are saying uh, bring more dowry because I want to uh, I want to marry this one off. Then around those, around this individual, the girl who is uh, vulnerable to violence, are people who make decisions. The immediate relations, is it the man? Uh, is it the boy? Uh, is it the teacher around? Uh, is it the, maybe the, the auntie, the singer who is pushing you, you go. Uh, you go get cut. After getting cut, you be called a woman. So they this immediate relations around this girl mm. and around these now who are living in a certain community. They are the cultural leaders, traditional leaders, the politicians who are either uh, loudly silent about the violence mm. uh, or who are not doing anything. But then they are also advocates. I like Bishop Kazimba Mugalu. Mm. During COVID, he's someone always started with violence in the homes. Mm. But he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a religious, a, a religious leader, leader. But he came out mm. boldly. Mm. And how, why can't all, of, all the leaders come mm. out boldly mm. like that? Then, of course, the, the rest is the, the society. Mm. Uh, if an institution which is supposed to transform us, like such as schools, is where you see a teacher impregnating a girl, then that's not an institution that is going to transform the country. Mm. So this whole ecosystem, the interlinkage, of, um, of um, the individual knowledge, and that's why people need to be educated. Um, the, the actions of the immediate relations, the, the role of traditional and the religious leaders, and the policies and government mm. should all work together. Okay. You cannot do it in one way or, or the other. They okay. should also happen together. 
um, to, to make sure that we end really this, this violence. M Maurice, you, you had the statistics here from, um, uh, from a court, uh, from uh, Noor, and, and of course uh, from everybody here. Uh, th does this inform uh, your industry? Uh, does this inform your work, your, your arts work or something like that? Uh, are you benefiting from it? And after this conversation, um, is there anything that you're picking here that can actually help you aid? Because yours now, uh, a visual, that uh, will be able to look at these things and actually I say we are actually doing a bad thing or we are in a bad situation. Uh, thank you, Mujeriz. I don't know if I got you so well, but if you're saying that the facts that I'm getting from around mm. good, these good people and uh, mm. the ones on the Zoom, yes, I'm getting uh, figures, I'm getting real, mm. real evidence. Empirical evidence. <laughs> exactly, because for us, most of us are filmmakers or creatives. We usually work around either experience mm. or imagination because we always have that mind that you know that big mind that imagines things you get it mm. but so with all this information that i've got of course mm. naturally if i uh, for as good it was if i was supposed to go again mm. at creating a masterpiece mm. definitely I think I'll be giving back to community much more than I have done this. Okay. Well, well I'll ask this question, which will also go to um, a court in Amuru, uh, because she's actually just right there, and, and she's, she sees these things. Uh, she's given us statistics here of 26% uh, GBV cases in the district, 24% in pregnancies, which I think is also a bad thing. Uh, Nuri also talked to us about this. Now, now it, it, it's a question that I want to pass to all of you. Uh, we know that it's criminal to actually uh, marry before 18. Uh, Article 31 of Uganda constitution is very clear on, on founding a family it, it clear says uh, for a, a man and a woman who are only 18 and above can actually uh, uh, start a family in uganda we've seen these things happening but uh, we've also seen parents uh, coming out to negotiate with the perpetrators uh, and this has also been a very big problem you go to districts where you find that um, uh, a 14 year old uh, and stuff like that uh, they get these problems but then the parents find ways of actually uh, managing to maneuver out of this situation now at times with the involvement of the police that's the other bit of, of it. It's on record that uh, the world's second youngest grandmother is actually Ugandan, uh, from either Busore or Mutareja, they're about at just the age of 28. Now, that also brings us to the social development question. How will we be able uh, to actually uh, socially develop this country if uh, we have grandparents who are only 28 years of age? I'm only thinking and I'm looking at the cycle because if you are a, grandfa a grandmother at just 28 percent, now that means you never went to school or you can even never go to school and the chance is that your daughter and their granddaughter grandson will also grow and go to school is, is actually it, it becomes a vicious cycle of uh, now just having a population that is uh, that dependent forever i i, I want you to uh, attempt this but i think um Nuri, if you're ready with us there uh, uh, please uh, uh, could you attempt that first before i uh, come back to studios where we are we can see you and we now need to hear from you Noor, can you hear us? Yes, please. You've heard us. Can you hear us? Did, did you hear what I said? The host is muting me. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. The, 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 <laughs> please. Yes, go. I can hear you. Yes. Um, uh, ca ca can you attempt the question that I asked if you had me earlier on? If I understood the question very well, um, on uh, early marriages, early and child marriages, of course, early marriage is subjective, but child marriages uh, are known. Uh, we find that nationally there are 25% uh, of Ugandans, uh, Ugandan women, have married early, like the young girls in the previous UDHS. But to be able to curb this as its advice, we would maybe have to enhance our education and enable these girls to go to school. For example, for these areas that we see these SGBV issues, we realize that it's rural and people don't have access to school. And we see that either uh, uh, there's one school that is very far away in, in another area and someone has to move, the terrain is so bad. And the only issue here, the only thing they resort to as they have got into adolescence is uh, getting married. So perhaps the government should do, be able to provide for these people subject, maybe, should we say, 
purposively they come up with specific schools that would address this this uh, this girls but also we could maybe enhance this the schemes the the, the work Hurry. different activities that could enable these people to do some work that makes them easy <laughs> uh, the the tivet is it uh, technical technical bit of it so that they can be able to do even if they do not go into academia but they can have this other skilling the skilling activities or skilling education that helps them get something else other than resulting to marriage that's what i would see as the best thing to to, to curb um, child marriages uh, no um a coach can you hear me because you are just right in the village there and uh, these things happen where uh, uh parents negotiate with the perpetrators uh, and they just go away with that um because um there the, are the, the lots of things that keep happening to them uh a coach, if you can hear me uh, please join us but if you're not yet with us then i think i'll come back to studios here uh, uh for us uh, and i'll start with you uh, commissioner nakafero on, on these very pertinent issues of course, uh, it's really very unfortunate that uh, as a country, mm. as parents, Ugandans, mm. women and men, mothers and fathers, we continue to subject our children to early marriage. Mm. It's unfortunate that uh, men and boys are continuing to subject girls. I had something from Nur that early and, early and child actually are different things. Early is subjective, then I think child is what we need to call them. But of course, how early is early? Uh, that, that also <laughs> is another thing, but we'll talk of about course, that. Of uh, course, we are looking mm. at the age of consent of 18 years. Below mm. 18 years, that is child marriage. Mm. Early marriage uh, and can, it's criminal. It's, it's criminal. It's, it's, it doesn't it's have criminal. To, to involve yeah. any discussion. Mm. So it's really unfortunate that we continue to do that. And of course, the implications are really great. Because if this girl is becoming a grandmother mm. at the age of 28, 28 mm. then it means that uh, herself, she never stepped in school. Mm. Her daughter never stepped in school. And, and, and even the grandchildren sure the grandchild are not going to, go to school. And of course, it's a vicious cycle. When you miss out education, you miss out so many opportunities. Mm. And of course, living a life of dignity. However, we are also saying that uh, as we work towards the elimination of all these forms of violence, these girls also need a second chance can we take them back to school because mm. that is the option that we have if we are going to make them into productive people that are going to contribute to national economy mm. they still can go back to school and pursue mm. their education mm. and of course this has to be a collaboration serious collaboration between parents mm. the minister has said yes but a lot of more support has to come from the parents mm. to be able to look after the grandchild to give this girl time to go to school and stay in school okay. and of course it's also the onus is on us especially men and boys mm. to desist from defiling these young girls mm. otherwise it's going to be a very challenging circumstances for all of us mm. Dorothy, on that particular one, uh, uh, on, on these issues, uh, the, the criminality, first of all, of marrying off um, young girls uh, to the perpetrators, but also to um, uh, the, the conniving parents, uh, because of quite, of quite a number of things, um, the, the illiterates, the, all these things. And, and just imagine now, if you are a grandparent of, of, of just 28, uh, and, and you allow your daughter, um, who is uh, a teenager, to also, also get into marriage and stuff like that, and, and these things keep happening, even when we do infrastructure development, and have all the outer belts built here, all the expressways, all the good roads from here to Kitguman everywhere. But when we have a social fiber, if we have a social fiber that is not developed, then I think we'll be wasting a lot of time as a country. Thank you so much. And I want to relate with uh, Commissioner Angela Nakafero. Mm. Nakafero. Um, she, rightly, she rightly put it. The issue of criminality is actually no question because the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, 1995, as amended, of course, is quite clear. 18 is the majority age where a boy and a, a woman mm. or a man can consent to actually form mm. a, family. a family. But then again, we have a problem when it comes to laws speaking to different issues. We have the Marriage, of, the marriage and Divorce Act, for example, the mm. Customary Act. Mm. All these speak to different ages. And at a certain point, they actually point out to 16 years, mm. for example. 
Mm. And these are archaic laws. These are really old laws that we should be now tackling and thinking deeply about either striking them off so that we are clear. Because mm. but, but the Constitution is supreme, actually, anything that the is in contravention of the is Constitution. The Constitution is actually supreme, but there's mm. always a misinterpretation also because people always raise a defense of, you know, there are these laws also mm. that are supportive. So I think it goes with a country sitting down and actually mapping out laws that are still relevant and not relevant when it comes to these mm. issues. The constitution is clear, but even how many people know it? And then if I'm a human being, I'll naturally look at a law that, that, that defends me, that looks out for my rights. I'll mm. not look at the law that speaks to the real truth of the issue mm. or the matter. Mm. And then when it, when it comes to issues of sexual offenses, I'm telling you the reality. When we go to communities, because we work in districts also, mm. uh, Bujiri, Buyikwe, Mayuge, um, Koboko, when you go there, the issues will always come up as one. Poverty has been a leading cause of early exactly. child marriages. Mm -hmm. Now, what even is worse is when you're trying to pursue these matters in the courts of law, before you even put your case facts together, you will hear that the parents negotiated with the perpetrator. Mm. Yeah? Out of court? Out of court. Like sort of either a vote yeah. has been given in mm. at the cost or the expense of this girl. Remember that this voice is challenged. She is looked at as a young mm. person. So her opinion will not matter actually in these negotiations. But no one is thinking about the burden this girl has been left with. Mm. If majority, actually, even when we say girls are being married off at 16, I think we are shooting high. It starts from 13. Mm. When you go to deep down there, cases start at 13. But biologically, are their bodies ready? These are the questions. Who is talking about the criminality of these issues? COVID came. Most of our girls were forced to be locked up with their abusers because abusers do not come from far away they are within us our fathers our uncles our cousins because we also have to be alive to the fact that our idea of gender is man a boy and girl or man and woman but there are other diverse issues that we shy to talk about mm. there are those who are non-binary for example we've heard about you know those contested issues but do you want to say that a fellow girl cannot molest a fellow child at home these cases are actually real so how gender sensitive are we we have a nas uh, the uganda national gender police for example all these are beautiful laws uganda for crying out loud has been pro gender sensitive but they remain on the shelf the right people that need this information is actually down there so when it comes to issues of access to justice sexual offenses have been one of the hardest cases to actually prosecute successfully one the issue of our design the structures of our courts in terms of the justice system. Mm. We need to look at this. If we have an anti-corruption court that is special, a unit, maybe it's high time gift Ugandan women and girls and the public gift us with a special sexual offenses court. Mm. Not, not the family court. Because family no, because court is family, more is also, you go through the normal procedures mm. and all, but cases of sexual uh, violence or abuse cannot wait. Imagine forced to keep spams of your perpetrator because it's evidence, or a nika, or Freezing clitoris is like one of the magistrates advised. How practical is this mm. in our criminal system or justice? How? So I think I implore that we need to revise our justice system when it comes to sexual offenses. Otherwise, all these beautiful laws and policies will continue remaining as a fat joke and a fallacy. Mm. Then, rightly, educate, educate, educate. All of us assume that people are lights but illiterate are so many in uganda like the percentages compared mm. to the elites is crazy and yet these are the people who are going through that same vicious mm. circle can we come up with strategies because already civil society organizations in partnerships mm. have been actually pushing through joint advocates for sexual and productive health rights for communities to be empowered with the necessary mm. information. Mm. The ministries have shared. There's no single day I've asked the Ministry of Education for a copy of the framework, and they do not give it to us. But how do we collectively ensure that this beautiful information does not remain with the elites and goes to the downer? The grassroots, for example. Okay. The justice referral pathways. We're talking about this today, but if a girl was defiled, would she know where to, str to trace from mm. justice? Do I report to court? After court, what happens? And then also the nature of our criminal system when it comes to these cases is the government against the perpetrator. Now, most state attorneys are probably busy, or some of these issues are expert issues. Can we encourage more state briefs, like where people can actually have the liberty to bring on board private lawyers? Because you know where there is money, there's that urge to push for justice. Things are not taken for 
granted. I think we really need to review this holistically. Otherwise, these cases will not stop despite our beautiful laws. Okay. And another thing before I go off on issues of criminality or generally laws and policies relating to sexual and gender-based violence is I think policies, we have over 16, laws over 15. There are quite a number that I can't list here. When you look at the Domestic Violence Act, you look at the penal code that was amended, you look at our constitution itself, you look at the national gender policy, gender policy. Mm. Um, you look at the CEDO that we ratified to against uh, uh, elimination of all forms of uh, violence against women, the International Covenant on <coughs> Political, Economic and Social Rights. All these are beautiful, but how are we contextualizing? beyond the first best development of laws as a nation, as Uganda, as policymakers, as stakeholders, do we sit back and actually revisit these laws and say they are doing well, mm. this has to be beefed up, or this should be struck off? Mm. We need to go back to that. Other than coming up with new laws every single day, let's first evaluate, monitor what we have right now and see if they are actually effective. Okay. The FGM is a sudden thing. It's terrible. Okay. Madam um, uh, Court, um, Margaret um, in Amuru, if you can actually hear us, how are you managing the situation where parents are actually negotiating with the perpetrators? Um, in, in the villages, I'm sure these things are actually happening in Amuru, uh, where you give us all these statistics, but yet again, uh, these people who do these bad vices to people uh, find a way of uh, negotiating uh, because of poverty. You just told us here that many of the youth are not doing anything uh, because they just sit and waste all the time in trading centers all day long. Uh, they, they are capable of doing things. How are you managing that situation of uh, uh, finding an amicable situation out of the law? Thank you very much. As a district, we have our CDOs, that is community development officers. We normally work hand in hand with them. And as you said, our mothers or fathers are very good at getting bravery. We have been sensitizing them that now your daughter has been defiled. Wait. You don't know the status of that eh? mm. man who has defiled your daughter. And you are getting this money. This money is not equivalent to your daughter's say, health. So we go on sensitizing them. Some are coming out of that eh? A habit of getting bribes from the perpetrators. And eh, we also use our VHTs and the local leaders to go down in the community that is the hard to reach area where gender-based violence is rampant. We move there together with them. We also move with the, our community development officers. We gather information from them as to who has been giving bribery. We go to them through the local leaders. We sit with them, discuss, and sensitize them on the danger of accepting those briberies. And of course, some of them want early marriages for dowry. We also sensitize them. This, is, this dowry is not equivalent to your daughter. Your daughter might be a, a future president. You never know if she continues with the studies. So in urban areas, they have realized that getting bravery does not work. This, we are still fighting the urban areas. So we are happy. Our CDOs are on their toes all the time, moving in the community, okay. sensitizing them. As health workers follow them during outreaches, we also sensitize them. And we are seeing that even if a mother or a father comes with a daughter who is raped or defied, a woman who is defied, they seek legal aids first. And then after that, they are referred to the health facility for registration. We always have our SGBV register book, even adolescent reproductive health book, where we record all these cases. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's uh, from Amuru district, just right there. Uh, coming back to studios, um, uh, gentlemen and, and ladies here, um, we um, talk about the 16 days of activism to end GBV against women and uh, the girls. Now, SDG 5 talks about achieving uh, gender equality. And uh, we are talking about, the, of course, achieving SDG, uh, um, um, the, the S, um, 
uh, the, 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 the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, will be in 2030. Now, we talk about um, uh, 10 years uh, from now. But considering Uganda and contextualizing Uganda as a patriarchal society, uh, Dr. Kagurusi, you help me on this, and of course all the others will respond to it. Uh, look at this situation of a patriarchal society where men feel they have entitlement over and above women. Do we think that SDG number five of uh, equality, gender equality, will actually be achieved uh, 10 years down the road, or we will keep making these discussions and conversations on TV, in conferences, on virtual on TV and everywhere and, and uh, by 2030 we will still be talked about uh, possibly an escalated problem or something there about. Uh, will you please help me on this? Uh, we are here for this but you think that uh, the patriarchal society that we live in that gives men entitlement can actually enable and help us achieve this goal by 2030? Um, the patriarchal society we live in is perhaps even centuries old. So you cannot give it uh, just 15 years and say it's going to be transformed. <laughs> but we are, we are moving in a certain mm. direction mm. and we need to keep making, making gains. Mm. And the way to make these gains is one, uh, educating mm. um, the girls and women and the boys and the men on how to live in a society uh, where we have gender equality. Mm. That must start now if you are going to see it in the future. The second is to make sure that we remove all those barriers uh, that keep us perpetually into gender inequality. And uh, one of the things they have talked about is mm. if we have now already good laws, uh, the beautiful laws that are here, why, for example, are they not translated? Why have they reached reach the community? Uh, what's the problem? Can't the community start discussing these kinds of things? So this is why we are here to, to light the spark mm. that we have very good laws, well thought about. So let them go down to the, to the communities. Mm. If we are having cultural institutions that uh, have been silent now, this is the time to come up and say uh, we are here and we are not uh, in for, for example, child marriage. Mm. I think I've heard from the Busoga Kingdom, for example, that they, they, they do not now certify uh, any child marriage, even if you did it uh, in a customary way. Mm. And we are happy with that. So we need to begin from somewhere. Mm. Um, and also, I need to mention that uh, on the issue we are discussing about the justice system, mm. I think there's even a very big challenge there. You know, a case takes three years, four years, and the cost. Mm. Uh, the cost of come back today, come back tomorrow, uh, the fire is lost, maybe it has been found, now it's at this person's place. The, the, there's no clear direction. So I think these are actions we can take now to say if somebody uh, has had the unfortunate incident of uh, experiencing this kind of violence, the case should be handled very quickly and, uh, and, and, and sorted. Um, I think it's also time uh, to say, no, look here. Uh, the cost of gender-based violence is very high. You are talking about dependency. Whether you want it or not, each Ugandan who is paying tax it actually supports 11 others who are not doing so. And the moment we keep on with this vicious cycle uh, of, uh, of violence, of um, early pregnancies, we have in uncontrollable, exponentially growing populations, because of violence, I think the cost we are going to pay is very high, and each one of us in Uganda is going to face it. Is going to face it. So the, the earlier we start, uh, the better. Okay. So the, the, the road to 2030, mm. even Vision 2040, I, I like the, the way you looked at it. Mm. You are building these um, mm. roads, mm. Uh, skyscrapers. Who is going to stay in them? Mm. Who is you are building dams? Mm. Who is going to pay for that electricity? Mm. Who is going eh? to drive on the who's, roads? Who is going to drive on the roads? Mm. Isn't it? So I think we need to look at it uh, not just mm. as cases and incidents that are happening. Mm. It is a whole issue of national development. Mm. And people must say, end to the violence, okay. uh, both men and, and women. Okay. Then also maybe just one last point about perpetrators. Mm. You see, yes, the, the, there is a violator who actually conducted the rape. But the LOC one who looks at the case and ignores it, 
the person who delayed to deliver justice, the policeman who made the negotiation, mm. uh, to, are all in the chain of perpetuation. And they should be having blood on their hands for refusing mm. to do something. Okay. So we, people must get out there, mm. as Ugandans must get out there, mm. to end violence against uh, girls and okay. women. Even boys, by the way. Mm. Uh, the boys, I don't want to forget them. They're also an endangered species. Endangered species in a way. In a way, mm. because this, <laughs> they are being forgotten. And mm. by then they, they, they are remembered. Mm. When it's late, actually. Oh, it will be very late. too late. Mm. Yeah, so even the boys also must also be protected, but also be, be knowledgeable. Okay. Not to be proud of the patriarchal society, mm. uh, which ends up making them criminals. I okay. think that's not correct. Com mm, Commissioner Nakafero, uh, uh, the, the question here is, uh, we talk about uh, a patriarchal society where men think or feel uh, they are entitled uh, to, to some of these things. And uh, uh, actually gleaning it from um, uh, Morris's video here um, that you saw, a man wants to come home and, and even actually get the little monies from uh, the woman that was left there to go and drink it with the boys out there and all these things to them and uh, we talk about uh, 16 days of activism um, which will happen every year now next year november 25th we'll do it and run up to uh, december 10th 2022 november 15th we'll actually november 25 we'll still do it 2023 we'll still do it but uh, looking at that uh, the society in which we live and uh, the the goal itself goal number five of uh, the SG, sdg 2030 uh, did you think we'll like, actually achieve this with the society that we have that uh, where the jagedas and the kagurus is the morris is here think they have a right over the dorothy's and, and the nakaferos well, as a country, mm. I have to uh, really admit and not just praising government for the sake, mm. but praising government that we've made progress mm. on quite a number of indicators. Okay? And, and long, along the way, we have the laws that are positive. But, uh, of course, for us to be able to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment, as Patrick is emphasizing, mm. the responsibilities to all of us. We can all do a lot in our mm. own context in terms of promoting gender equality and women's empowerment in this country. Mm. And of course, uh, different ways as parents, mm. we need to nurture our girls equally with the boys, mm. give them a right to education, ensure that they access the nutrition that everybody is accessing. Mm. Even when they are pregnant, give them a second chance to go back to education. By that, you'll be contributing <coughs> the achievement of equality in this country. Mm. We need to ensure that we support government in implementing the laws. Okay? By taking positive actions, it's very, very important. Changing our values, already we are engaging with the cultural and religious institutions mm. to ensure that uh, we are able to change our negative social norms into norms that are going to value women and girls, mm. that are going to promote women living the life of dignity. Mm. And of course, all this cannot be achieved alone as government. Okay. We all need to work together. Okay. Male involvement, as Patrick is emphasizing, is very critical. Mm. We need men and boys as our allies. Okay. More on that particular. We have mm. a lot of power, mm. but we need to be able to share that power mm. so that uh, all of us are treated equally. Morris, yes. speak to us as a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I speak to you as a, as a man filmmaker. Yes. Uh, I think this is a call. Mm. Like uh, Commissioner said, that this is upon us. The onus is on us. We should not just look at the ministry or the government or the stakeholders in this thing. Exactly. Mm. We should pitch in as human beings. You get it? If you're a father in a home, how do you how do you behave like how do you treat your wife if you're a boyfriend somewhere because i've seen cases where a young man of 23 years is busy hitting on a young lady he's not or married her. Or he hasn't paid dowry he hasn't the parents probably don't even know mm. this boy in the picture but you find him fighting with a girl mm. you get the point so i think we should just not even look at people who are grown up in homes because that's how we always kind of contextualize it mm -hmm. but even the young boys because i mean they're the men of tomorrow you get the point mm -hmm. so i think like they always say <laughs> i don't know that statement if it makes sense mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. get the point like everyone should take it upon himself mm -hmm. or herself to make sure that we live in a more beautiful uganda mm -hmm. yes uh, dorothy 
or the society, the patriarchal society that we live in? <laughs> Again, I think issues to do with social change or cultural norms or behavior, is, it, it goes back to the roots. Our laws are coming to address the cream, what is on top. Mm. No one really looks at the structural issues, the causes of the real issue or what the real matter is. So I think male dominance and power over and um, the, it's, it's beyond the boy that you see today because they also grew up in that setting where you know, the power is there. They're already given that power. But what we've seen and what is failing us in terms of advocacy is while we are designing interventions to help out the young girl and the woman, we're not actually designing interventions that speak to the young boys and men. Beyond just being perpetrators like the commissioner states, how do we bring them on board as allies? Norms are very complicated. I'm telling you, you can go to, a, to Karamoja with your beautiful intervention, but if you don't have the buy-in of the people, I can guarantee you they will frustrate it to the bottom of the matter. Like, they will not even give it a second chance. So how do we map out who, like, who we want to actually start engaging? Most times we start from top, bottom approach. How about if we reverse the approach and went bottom, top? Because when you're looking at elders, these elders have mm -hmm. always been at the forefront of idolizing or ensuring that some of these cultural practices or norms do not die out. And a clear example is the FGM, where people will show you that even if you brought in a law, mm -hmm. we shall cross over to Kenya because we are holding our values. But if we brought in like champions, for example, and we brought in an elder that speaks to his fellow people, they will actually understand. So the issue of patriarchy is just beyond what we see on the face of it. It's deeply rooted on where we learn from. Let me give you a very classic example. When a boy is served food at the dining, a girl who has fetched water, looks for firewood, and all those things will be given like a small portion, but the boy will be given a whole mountain. Mm. So already you're trying to show that there is that difference. Difference. Mm. So it starts within our households, and like everybody on this panel has agreed, how do we collectively come up right from households to take up our roles and bring out these injustices mm. in a manner that puts on us obligations and responsibilities? Mm. NGO, civil society will do its responsibility. The ministries, the government will try, mm. but they say that grounding and grooming starts from mm. home. So I would implore that we also bring on board more voices from cultural institutes, for example. I think we even have policies or laws on cultural mm. institutions and regulations. Let's bring them on board and have deeper conversations in breaking the barriers mm. that we are looking at right now. Otherwise, I know that social norms, cultural mindset and all is progressive. Mm. That's why when you say that next year we shall be again 16 days of activism, what has changed? Mm. No, we are learning from these discussions. I'm sure the Minister of Gender is picking up, AMREF is picking up, the production person is picking up these issues, and next time we shall do better. So I think for me, patriarchy is just beyond blaming the perpetrators or the male voices. How do we engage culture and religious institutions okay. to actually let them appreciate that this is collective effort, they are part of the change mm. that we desire to see? Mm. And how do we boldly stand up and say that these are the things that we've mapped out mm. that negatively impact our, our young girls and women okay. and boys? Okay. And what can we do as leaders who are responsible mm. to ensure that these innocent people actually are protected mm. from all the harm that we see mm. that continues? If we do not take people to courts of law, mm -hmm. conclude cases, do you think perpetrators will actually take us serious? On, on the issue of courts, um, I, I think Nakafaro will come in here, Commissioner Nakafaro. You, you all might respond to this. But, but you see, when we talk about the courts or so, uh, you'll notice that um, at, at the end of the day, this girl, um, the teenage girl, for example, who was uh, defiled or raped, and uh, she's now having a baby. Now, justice to her does not mean that uh, the perpetrator actually goes to Luzira or to whichever prison. 
Justice to them is actually uh, maybe asking uh, the man responsible to take care of this baby. Now, you, you get a situation where um, you've gone to court, you've concluded the case, uh, the man is being sent to prison uh, for a number of years. But you have this girl here uh, who is in, who, from, from a poor family. Uh, she didn't go to school. She's looking after a two, three, four year old baby. And she needs to find something to find for the baby. And, and when you talk about justice yourself, um, you will be happy from the civil society. Sehad will be happy that um, this perpetrator has actually finally gone to Chitalia or to whatever prison. But then the girl here is, is actually not looking at that as justice because uh, she has nobody. Sehad is not going to find food for my baby. Sehad is not going to take my child to school. Sehad is not going to pay for my rent. And they would rather think that actually the justice system brings these people to responsibility. Uh, let's talk about that issue also because we talk about justice. We want these people to actually go to prison. But does justice mean the same thing to all of us, including this baby and the mother of the baby? And Nakafer, I think you need to respond to this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated mm. when we look at it. But of course, uh, when we are in, under the courts of law, we are looking at the laws. And the instance of the law is to de deter mm. the vice. Mm. And in this case, the vice of environment. Mm. So when we are with our land friends, the issue is have this puppet winter serve his point, serve his uh, sentence. His sentence. Mm -hmm. And that is the law, and that is what we are pushing for. Mm. Along the way, we are also saying that uh, these girls also need to be protected. Mm. It doesn't mean that they need to be protected in the hands of the perpetrator, mm. but they can be equally protected in the arms of the parents and the communities. Mm. Because if you, you, you take it that uh, this girl goes with a perfect water, mm. it's going to be a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. But if we can have this girl re being retained in a parental home, mm. being given a chance to go back to school, mm. the life of this girl is going to transform for the better. Actually, I think yes, uh, my, from that angle. But, but Dr. Kagurusia talked about something where it actually takes longer. Now, now look at a situation where maybe uh, the defiled girl was uh, uh, 16 years. Of course, that's another age. And uh, the, the case is concluded five years later. Now, now a 16 year is now 21. Uh, the baby, uh, the, the pregnancy that time uh, has now turned into a five year old baby. Now, now, you look at a girl who has actually now grown of age. She's 21. Yes, no longer uh, vulnerable. She was before. You have a baby who is uh, five years. She needs to go to school like all the other children around. And, and now uh, the case has been concluded five years later uh, when the girl is 21, the baby is five years. And they're saying, please go to jail uh, for, for seven years. Uh, and this girl is actually asking. And the parents are also now looking because what happened initially, ab initial, was because the parents were actually in that state or situation where they couldn't afford for the baby. Now that the girl is 21 and they're living out of fate. So, so I think uh, these are the conversations that all of you need to uh, uh, engage in. Uh, <laughs> from the civil society mostly, uh, it's sad. Uh, you know, the, the, that's why it, it all takes us. But, but uh, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, uh, just a little bit. Yes, just a little I bit. I actually was talking about justice in courts. Mm. But what I was about to mention before we got off, or shortly, was in every docket that we see it in, whether you're a minister, whether you're a judge, you're a human being. Mm. You have your values that you're attached to certain issues. So if a, court, a, a, a case that of that nature comes to a person who is overly patriarchal in beliefs and all, no matter how much you prepare on this side, Sometimes even principles of law will not save you. Mm. So it starts with a mindset and also training our stakeholders in their different dockets, mm. what human rights mean and the kind of different approaches. Because even in law school, we are not, it's not compulsory to go through human rights training. Mm. I will tell you that. People learn on the job. So I think we can do better by having capacity buildings and trainings mm. that we need to take on. But I'll bring you to the issue that you've just raised in terms of what next? Mm. What, what is justice like in the face of the person who has been sinned against or mm. wronged? Uh, when we're looking at SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, there's Goal 3. Mm. Goal 3 talks about livelihood and the well-being of women and girls, those who have faced maternal issues and all like how do we design an approach that is considerate of the after all this, what happens? Are we looking at the emotional well-being of this person, the social economic? So again, 
the best we can do as civil society is actually empower people with the different interventions that exist. Mm -hmm. I must say that first justice is not having the perpetrator go in court. Mm -hmm. We actually follow up. We really go out and find out what is the situation of this girl. Okay. But you see, you're not a charity organization, or you cannot solve every problem. problem. Exactly. And that's why information sharing is mm. key, but also most importantly, designing approaches. Mm. So we're also learning from you, the take home, what, mm. kind of what, kind of, what justice kind of looks to us. And now when we're designing interventions in the future or as soon as possible, mm. we should also be looking at the after mm. life of this girl who has been sinned against, okay. or boy, or woman, what is their afterlife like? Do we want to change the nature of our punishments, the kind of damages that the laws provide for? What do we do? Because we are all on the table okay. trying to find solutions. Okay. And I must say the issue you raise is valid. During the COVID time, the country recognized that so many young girls were actually getting pregnant. Mm. They needed a second chance. And I think a policy was put in mm. place. But then, what happens to this young child that has been left fatherless, for example? Okay. And this girl that is raising a, ch a fellow child, raising a fellow child. Mm. All these go back to the different stakeholders, but mainly the policy makers. Mm. When you're designing damages or when you're designing remedies, we need to be alive to the fact that beyond just grabbing the perpetrator, life has to continue for this person okay. who has been sinned against. So it comes back to the kind of interventions okay. that we design in our laws, okay. in our policies, and in our guidelines as a nation. Okay. Well, well because we're trying to uh, conclude this and uh, try to finish, I'll come back to you who um, are in virtual space. Um, Noor, uh, just to you as uh, we, we get to conclude. We are celebrating 16 days of activism and um, I'm only thinking the public has had a speak. They've had the engagement and they've been part of this. Uh, but what do you think um, needs to be done? How should the public respond to the clarion call? What should the public do uh, going forward? Now, we, we have quite a number of days and of course it doesn't stop uh, on the 10th of December. Uh, after 10th December, we can't say we close uh, the conversation of GBV down until November next year, 2020. But, but from you, Noor, um, uh, before I let you go, I, I want to hear from you. What uh, do you think um, uh, the public needs to do uh, to respond to the clarion call? Okay. Thank you very much, moderator. Yes, go ahead and speak to us. We can hear you. All right. On the Zoom here, I, I see you still speaking. Well, I would like to first go back to the, uh, the issue on the patriarchal society. Uh, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics has uh, recognized the role for statistics, and through the Plan for National Statistical Development, we have uh, realized that well, we have generated the national priority gender indicators for which we hope that everyone should mark themselves and start monitoring on the different indicators that respond to the gender, you know? Because if we cannot monitor something, if we cannot monitor something, if we can't appreciate it, we have not the data, we can't appreciate it, and if we can't monitor it, then we cannot know the progress. So on that issue of whether we shall be able to achieve the SDG yeah, 2030, SDG 5 in line with the 2030, we, 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 we believe that since people have recognized, look on the panel here, on the, on, the, on the screen I can see four gentlemen, and I mean three gentlemen, and they're all talking about this issue of SGBV, that is already a step, and then plus the laws in, in place, and also the, the fact that we have different frameworks that are enabling us to monitor. Right now, we have the Equal Opportunities Commission, uh, that is also in ensuring that there is gender and equity budgeting across the different organizations, the government institutions. So that also shows that somehow we shall achieve something, we shall not remain the way we are in terms of gender, uh, gender issues. So for me, in uh, line with what should we do, I think we still have to, uh, I still want to agree with everyone here who say we need to come up with different programs that touch us from home. I used to watch my parents, my father, cook, wash, sweep. Can the men also do this? Can we come up with models? Uh, a gentleman, can we see doctor here? Come up with a video and show us when he is cooking at home and life is good. Recently, a certain musician 
um, Waiki Bender. He was uh, showing when he's washing the baby and cleaning the baby, and it did not seem difficult, you know? So everyone on social media was saying, hey, a man can wash, a man can clean a baby. He doesn't feel bad to also do such things. So if we keep up show, uh, with the models who people can believe in, then it can be good. But also, we need to empower these religious leaders in the mosque and the church. If we go to the mosque every Friday, can we bring on board the interreligious council so that they talk to these people and tell them, you, even if you're a Muslim man, you have four ladies, you can be able to do this. The prophet did this. As a Christian man, Jesus did this. He was able to do this for his, even fed the, the poor. That can be able to help uh, everyone change their mind state and not be there and say a man is a man. Okay. Just because a man is above in the Bible right. doesn't mean he cannot do certain things. And that can be able to address the issue of patriarchy. And also, I want to agree with Madame of, the, of Sedap. She said the, the laws, we need to improve on the regulatory impact assessments before we come up with a law. You cannot just come up with a law and say, this is going to come out with such an output. It may not necessarily come out with the outcome you expect. Go down there and move with these people pace by pace. What works for them? And you'll be able to uh, maybe come up with better interventions. But lastly, the different referral pathways for the GBV. Can we empower them? For example, when we were in the in the Bay region for this G, uh, FGM, the police, they would tell you that by the time they run to a certain area, it's hilly, it's mountainous, there's no fuel, you have to run and go and catch someone who is going to be cut or who is going to cut. It takes a long time and the roads are bad and you cannot and has no uh, the, the resources. Can we help these people? And also, the same person who is catching is also, like Madame said, he's, he's, he is also engraved in the culture. Can we talk to them to do their work and uh, and help them uh, deliver better? Then uh, the last test, maybe I would say, is the economic activities in these areas. Let's empower these people. Even school is there, the formal education, but we also have to come up with the president was encouraging the different uh, activities relating to technical studies. Can we encourage these ladies? Because when you're busy, you cannot think about doing such activities that are against the law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noor. And uh, finally from you, uh, Margaret Akot uh, in Amuru. In just uh, one minute, if you can actually also just uh, conclude and sum it up, what do you think uh, the public needs to do uh, to you, Margaret, in Amuru, in, in just um, less than two minutes? Very much. To me, I feel we should empower women more and more. Mm. At the same time, we should also empower our local leaders, our VHTs, and the CDOs. Because these are community organs. They are always together with the community from January to December. And they go on sensitizing community about the equality. At the same time, health workers should also be empowered as they move for averages in hard to reach areas. And we know those are the worst areas in our community, like in Amuru. And even the poorest areas in Amuru is in hard to reach area. So if health workers are employed by adding more human resource, I think we are going to at least spread the gospel of equality. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I just want to thank my two uh, panelists uh, just right there um, on Zoom. Um, Margaret, a coach, uh, the Assistant District um, Health Commissioner from Amuru District, thank you so much uh, for engaging us and for, for being with us all through uh, these uh, two hours of uh, uh, discussion or conversation uh, this uh, very evening. And of course, thanking you also, uh, Noor Kasim, uh, a statistician uh, from the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. We thank you so much because you also gave us a very good um, uh, information and details on how to actually manage and go about uh, with the discussion here. Now, as I say bye to you, I'll come back to studio and uh, use just a minute for all of us here uh, to uh, say their final remarks. And I'll start with you, uh, Dorothy. Uh, finally, um, in just one minute, let the public know what they're supposed to do as, uh, re as a response to the Clarion Call. I think let's be all conversant of the fact that uh, change begins with us. And then to, to the political will, 
it's key for us to actually come up with laws and policies that the public can relate with okay. to be able to tackle these issues that we talk about or that are looked at from the domestic level if we really want to achieve gender equality. Okay. To the advocates, in terms of our interventions, let's be open to the fact that we are different levels under advocacy and let's frame messages to reach to the different categories of people, right from the grassroots to the sub-national to the national, and also more best experiences on how other countries or models have been able to actually try to achieve the equality issue that we are grappling with as a country to be able to prevent and avert uh, sexual and gender-based violence in Uganda. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Dorothy Amron um, is a campaigns partnership and networks manager uh, from the Center for Health, Human Rights Development. I said, uh, we thank you so much uh, for having allowed to join us and sparing this time to be with us uh, this um, afternoon. Uh, finally, from you in one minute, uh, Mr. Filmmaker, Maurice uh, Mujisha of More Ideas. Mm. Uh, personally, as a media person, I would call upon people at home because you see, uh, home is the smallest community, but that's where these wonderful people of ours come from. Uh, we should take it upon ourselves and families to make sure that we raise our kids. This goes out to every parent. Uh, we should raise our kids in a manner that actually polishes them to look at, you know, the girl and the boy as the what? You know, the same. Basically, I'm calling upon equality in homes because that's where it should start from. By the time the state or the minister or the person with uh, policies comes in, probably they have somewhere to start because even if they did come in and did whatever they had to do, when this, uh, the route is rotten, I think we are shooting blanks. Okay. So as a filmmaker, I'm also calling upon TV stations where you work, uh, any media platforms, we should adopt a culture of creating material that is that is pro morality you get the point i'll give examples of mushrooming television stations mm. very many radio stations Quite a number of them. but look at the stuff that is on tv mm. you get the point mm. so i'm calling upon uh, madam commissioner you should inject <laughs> money in <laughs> filmmakers they should inject money in us so that we produce we produce more of those films mm. that actually combat or change mindsets mm. take for example uh, i don't know how many how many uh, educative films or educative dramas that you have lined up on ubc mm. you get the point and any other uh, television stations you okay. get it so yeah. i'm calling upon everyone <laughs> Madam mm. Commissioner, do something, oil our wheels so we can be able to push content. Because remember, film is the way to go. Okay. We can have all these dialogues and all, but also as film, it goes far and wide. You get the point. Mm. Yes, because this way, if I produce a film in English, I can be able to translate it and push it in uh, uh, where Amuru, Kabale, uh, Sironko, mm. pushing the same message in the shortest time mm. possible. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Boris Mujisha. Mr. Boris Mujisha is a arts director and also a filmmaker uh, from the More Ideas. And the film that is coming on is, uh, what did you call it? Stain. Stain. Yeah. Uh, Stain is okay, the movie that is coming on. We thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Commissioner Nakafero from the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development. In just one minute, let's conclude this. Thank you very much. As we conclude, I would like to make an appeal to all partners and government to increase the funding because most of the interventions that colleagues have been talking about are interventions that we are currently implementing as Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. Mm. What we need is to scale up our inter interventions mm. all throughout the country so that uh, these interventions can have impact on the lives of women and men, girls and boys in this country. Okay. So let's scale up the implementation of all this mm. and at the end of the day women and girls let's report cases and seek for justice okay thank you well thank you so much uh, dr kagurusi uh patrick um uh, amref country manager please your final remarks uh, i'd like to take this opportunity to thank the distinguished panelists here mm. and those who joined us uh, virtually uh, for the excellent conversation we have just had I also like to take this opportunity to really call upon Ugandans uh, from the forest, smallest unit of our society, which is the family, really to go for gender equality, uh, having both uh, girls and boys, uh, men and women, 
uh, living happy and productive lives uh, should be everyone's uh, vision. Let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, our funders, um, the Kingdom and the people of Netherlands mm. uh, for actually making it true the campaign, the, the theme of this campaign, which is about funding, and they really to say we as civil society and the people you see are remain committed, uh, really to address the issues of gender that uh, should build uh, the st strong fabric of our of our community. Thank you, uh, UBC. I thank also my colleagues at AMREF really for putting this together. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for having allowed to uh, spare this time to be here uh, tonight or this evening with us as uh, we've gone through uh, the, um, uh, the, the Amre South Africa talk show on creating increased awareness on GBV against women and girls. And of course, also uh, talking about uh, this dialogue on uh, the 16 days of activism against GBV and the harmful practices in Uganda, I specifically want to thank all of you. Thanking you, Dorothy from uh, Seha. Thank you for joining us. I thank you, Maurice Mjisha from The More Ideas, the filmmaker, for joining us. I thank you so much, Commissioner Nakafero Angela from the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. Uh, Dr. Kaguru C. Patrick, I also thank you so much from Amref. And uh, thanking, of course, uh, those um, uh, on Zoom. Uh, Margaret Accord from Amuru, we thank you so much. And uh, thanking you so much. Uh, Kasim uh, from uh, Yubos uh, just right there. And of course, thanking uh, the Embassy of Netherlands and of course UBC uh, TV. We'll stop the debate here and we just show that uh, yes, you've been with us and uh, this concerns all of us. It shouldn't be uh, to them only. It should be uh, for everybody. Just as uh, Maurice Azokele said, let's get there, let's get involved and it should be um, our responsibility, all of us as uh, uh, people. Uh, let's uh, love humanity. Let's do our best. We thank you so much. My name is Jagan Asimakola Zixoka, wishing you a very uh, blessed Sunday evening. As we continue inspiring Uganda, for God and my country, stay blessed and good evening. Thank you. Supported by Foreign Affairs Ministry in the Netherlands and Armor of Health Africa. Airtel introduces Double Data, the biggest deal ever on smartphones in Uganda. Buy a smartphone, 3G or 4G, and get 100% data bonus from Airtel. Airtel is giving you 100% bonus data on all weekly and monthly bundles for every new smartphone connected to Airtel for the first three months. Dial star 175 star 9 hash to enjoy Double Data. Double Data, Double Data. Oh, bino vie bino mabaya, yeah. Airtel, the smartphone network, regulated by Uganda Communications Commission. The taxpayers' appreciation season is here. We 